Good morning. I want you to imagine for a moment a king. This king is riding into his kingdom. Can you picture him? Probably all have images in our head of what this looks like, uh, maybe from movies or fairy tales, uh, stories that we've heard. As Americans, we're a little bit at a loss for a relationship between a, a king and his subjects. And no doubt we are picturing someone. Today, in observation of Palm Sunday and in preparation for Holy Week, we're going to examine Jesus' triumphal entry as king into Jerusalem. And actually, we're going to see hints to all three of his offices as prophet, priest, and king in today's passage. <clears throat> now, mind you, this is an event so important that's recorded in all four gospel accounts. And we're going to see that as king, Jesus revealed himself as something totally unexpected, someone totally unexpected unprecedented. Steve Lambert of Capitol Hill Baptist Church on his reflection on the differences between Christianity and Islam said, in no other manner are the differences between Muslims and Christians more sharply contrasted than in the difference between the characters and legacies of their prophets. Perhaps the contrast is best symbolized by the way Muhammad entered Mecca and Jesus entered Jerusalem. Muhammad rode into Mecca on a war horse, surrounded by 400 mounted men and 10,000 foot soldiers. Those who greeted him were absorbed into his movement. Those who resisted him were vanquished, killed, or enslaved. Muhammad conquered Mecca and took control as its new religious, political, and military leader. Today in the Tokapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, Muhammad's purported sword is proudly on display. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, accompanied by his 12 disciples. He was welcomed and greeted by people waving palm fronds, a traditional sign of peace. That's what's in front of me, what these palms represent. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because the Jews mistook him for an earthly, secular king who was to free them from the yoke of Rome, whereas Jesus came to establish a much different heavenly kingdom. Jesus came by invitation and not by force, and today in Christian churches everywhere, a cross is proudly on display. Last week, we spoke of the transfiguration. We imagined the fear and joy of the eyewitnesses to this event. Peter, John, and James, his inner sanctum, his, his inner apostles, witnessed the glory of Jesus. They felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. They heard from the Father himself. They saw Moses and Elijah who were representing the law and the prophets. And what were they doing? They were encouraging Jesus. What were they encouraging for? Well, he was preparing for his trek to the cross, and they were building him up for that push. Peter inquired about building tents there. Why? Because he didn't want to leave. He was, he was in heaven. That's what heaven is, being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Yet immediately upon coming down that mountain, and we'll look at this in a couple of weeks as we preach through Mark, they come down the mountain and they're going to be beset with the reality of this world, this fallen world. A father with his demon-possessed son seeking healing from Jesus. Scribes arguing with the remaining disciples, the nine who were left behind. And soon after, Jesus announces to them that we're going to Jerusalem. Despite the fact that he'd been prophesying that he must suffer. He must be rejected. He will be killed. I wonder if there had been some comfort knowing that they're far from Jerusalem. We're in Caesarea Philippi. I'm 100 miles away from Jerusalem. It wasn't yesterday I drove 
500 and five, no, 700 miles, 700 miles in the rain to get here. In the first century, 100 miles when you're traveling by foot is the other side of the world. So these things are going to happen to you in Jerusalem. Let's stay up here in the north. Let's stay far from Jerusalem. Let's avoid this suffering, rejection, and death. They had been trying to do that. That's why he called, told Peter, get behind me, Satan. This is a message from Satan. I'm taking that crown, but I have to go to that cross. And think of it. There were 13 of them. I don't know about you. I've, I've, I've hung with some pretty tough dudes. Part of that is having been a cop. If I'm with 13 of my friends, I'm okay. Most places I go to, I'm all right. Unless the odds change. Send us into a riot, and now I want a few more guys. In Luke 19, 31 through 34, we read, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was being said. What do you think they were thinking? Jerusalem? That's where the chief priests and scribes outnumber us. It's where there's a large number of Gentiles. The Romans in power are the ones who flog and kill people. Why go to them? This must have weighed heavily on their minds as they heard this. We see in John's gospel that when Jesus wanted to go to Bethany to resurrect Lazarus, Lazarus, it elicited quite a response from Thomas. In John 11, 14 through 6, I love Thomas. I can relate to Thomas. Listen to this. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Why did Thomas assume that they would all join Lazarus in death? Because Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem. Yet as we will see, this entrance into Jerusalem by Jesus presents perhaps the most joyous moment in his ministry. It's going to tell us exactly what kind of king we serve. Throughout the gospel accounts, Jesus was often quite secretive about his miracles. He, he, He was secretive about his nature. Don't tell anyone, he would say. Well, the time has come to not only tell everyone, but also show them. So look at uh, Matthew 21. I'll read 1 through 5. Now, when they came near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, of a beast of burden. So we begin with Jesus' simple instructions to two of his disciples to go find him a couple donkeys. These instructions are so specific that it's actually pointing to and is a revelation of his divine omniscience with so many other things that he would say and would come true. He is a prophet. This is only in Matthew's gospel that we... uh, See them bring both animals, mother and son, mare and foal. Luke's account tells us this colt had never been ridden before. You know, when I was a kid in upstate New York, we had horses. Um, We had at one point five horses. And there's something about horses and donkeys, I assume, are very similar. They are herd animals. 
It's a 1,500 pound animal that likes to get up and go if, some, if it's something scares it. So you have to know what you're doing around them. I could dictate when I was a kid what type of trail ride I could send you on based on which horses I put on that ride what horse I put you on, and where I placed those horses. We had, a, we had a big, powerful quarter horse who was, he didn't run for anybody. He didn't move fast for no one. If I put him in front, he was the bully of the group. Nobody would pass him, and that would control the whole herd as we went through the woods. If I picked another two horses, like my dad's Arabian and my hackney pony, these two active, exuberant, energetic horses, I could send you on a, a steeplechase as they'd be racing each other through, the, through our woods. I think the mother was brought along to keep the full calm. This unbroken donkey was being ridden for the first time with a large crowd bearing down on them. And that's not prime conditions for training. Perhaps mom would settle him. In verse 3, we see more revelation of Jesus' deity as he anticipates a conversation with the owner. He also explains that the owner of these donkeys will be fine with them being borrowed. But look closely at, he, at how Jesus identifies himself. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. Not my Lord needs them, but the Lord. This is another claim to deity. He is more than another master, teacher, or rabbi. He is the Lord, the Lord of all. In verses 4 and 5, we see that Jesus is the prophesied king. It's a direct quote from Zechariah 9.9, 9, which Ray read to us, which was quoted here in Matthew. And 500 years earlier, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt. The foal of a donkey. Look again at that prophesied king. He is a righteous king. Perhaps that's something so significant about David. David. Despite being the man after God's own heart, like every man, he was flawed. Despite being known as Israel's greatest king up to this point, he could never be considered as her righteous king. That's evident because David's sin was documented for all of us to know. Even in Jesus' genealogy, we're reminded of this. Have you ever thought about that? In Matthew 1.6, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He was Israel's greatest king. David fathered the wisest king, Solomon. And yet his wife's rightful husband, Uriah, the man David killed, was immortalized in Scripture. David's lowest acts weren't just revealed in his story. They were preserved in Christ's genealogy. Yet on his deathbed, David would settle the question of who would be the heir of his throne between two of his sons, Solomon and Adonijah, to cement his decision in the minds of his people. He had Solomon ride into Jerusalem on a mule in 1 Kings Chapter 1, a cross between a horse and a donkey. Let's look at verses 6 through 11 of Matthew 21. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's estimated that during this week of Passover, the population of Jerusalem would swell to five or six times its usual size. People would come in observance of the Feast of Remembrance. 
the feast to remind them of when God rescued their fathers from slavery in Egypt and brought salvation through the blood of the Lamb. Now the Lamb of God was coming into Jerusalem. And he chose Passover week to make his grand entrance into his city. There are no coincidences with our God. And when Jesus rose into the capital of his people, he was stamping himself before all those witnesses as their king and their priest. But get this. The priest was bringing himself as a sacrifice. It's heavy. Think about that. This king, this prophet, is riding humbly into his city to present himself as the sacrifice. And we see in response to this king, the people laid their cloaks and palm branches in his path, giving rise to the name Palm Sunday. Jesus was receiving the royal treatment. The fact they laid down their cloaks was reminiscent of King Jehu at his coronation in 2 Kings 9.13. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. In John 12, 12 through 13, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna is a word found in songs of praise. Often we think of it in a similar vein to hallelujah, as we sang this morning, but Hosanna is more than praise. Hosanna is a plea, a plea for salvation. Hosanna contains the Hebrew root words of Yasha and Anna. Yasha means deliver, save, and Anna means beg, beseech. The people were quoting Psalm 118.25, a psalm of ascent. This is something they would be singing while entering Jerusalem for their holidays. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. This is part of several chapters in the Psalms that shows the people celebrating Passover. This is literally translated to, I beg you to save us. Now, for those of us who do not trace our ancestry to Jewish blood back to Israel, the very next verse, Zechariah also prophesied that he is our king. In Zechariah 9.10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In John's account of this entry, we realize that there was a collision of forces taking place. Jesus had been followed by the eyewitnesses to Lazarus's resurrection. And many in Jerusalem had heard about this latest sign, and so they were preparing to receive him. This explains why Jesus so often told people to tell no one what he had done. After so many of his miracles, tell no one. The guy just received his speech back. I finally can speak for the first time in my life, and I can't tell anybody the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. Go and tell no one. Jesus knew that people would seek signs and wonders and miracles, yet they would miss who all of those signs were pointing to. A sign means nothing if it's not pointing to Christ. In response to Lazarus' resurrection, the Pharisees were fuming. In John 12, 18 and 19, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign, right? He wrote, raised the guy dead for four days. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now what did they do? They planned to kill Lazarus. Poor Lazarus, within a few weeks he gets to get killed twice, I guess. 
And after in John 12, 21 through 23, Jesus was at a feast and some Gentiles came to see him. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. G uh, Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. His glorification would reveal him as much more than just Israel's king. As Zechariah had prophesied, this king will rule over all nations from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. So earlier we imagined a king riding into his kingdom. And then I pointed out two royal entries into capital cities. One is what the world would expect of a conquering king. The other is not. One king would offer what the world craves. The other king would offer what the world rejects. Which king fits your imagination? I, I picture a big, middle-aged, muscular guy with a beard Riding on, riding on his beautiful steed, his beautiful horse. <laughs> Blowing snot everywhere. That's the king I picture. A powerful war horse. I'm ashamed to say that. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was hailed as a king coming from the house of David. The streets were packed with the citizens of Israel who wanted to see their king and cheer him publicly. But Jesus chose to reveal something very different than they expected. Tim Keller said he didn't ride in on a powerful war horse the way a king would. He was mounted on a polos, that is a colt or a small donkey. Here is Jesus Christ, the king of authoritative, miraculous power, riding into town on a steed fit for a child, or as Tim Keller says, a hobbit. In this way, Jesus let it be known that he was the one prophesied in Zechariah. This odd juxtaposition demonstrates that Jesus was king, but that he didn't fit into the world's categories of kingship. He brought together majesty and meekness. Jesus' apostle John would see this juxtaposition of our servant king and his prophetic vision in Revelation 5, 5 through 6. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll in its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Do you see what happened there? John is waiting for a lion. And instead he sees in the midst of the throne a lamb, a slain lamb. Just as the people of Israel were looking for a conquering king and instead received a servant king, a king prepared to sacrifice himself. Jonathan Edwards preached a famous sermon in 1738 titled The Excellency of Christ in which Edwards said the lion excels in strength and in the majesty of his appearance and voice. The lamb excels in meekness and patience. He is sacrificed for food and for clothing. But we see that Christ is in the text compared to both because the diverse excellencies of both are both wonderfully met in him. There is in Jesus Christ a conjunction of such really diverse excellencies as otherwise would have seemed to us utterly incompatible in the same subject. 
It is only in Jesus that we find character traits that the world would consider mutually exclusive. Yet for him, they blend together perfectly, seamlessly. Only in Jesus do we find infinite majesty and complete humility. Perfect justice with boundless grace. Absolute sovereignty, yet utter submission. All sufficiency in himself, however entire trust and dependence on God, his Father. Only with Jesus can you find such seeming contradictions in one personality, completely and beautifully whole, and not be dealing with a lunatic. He is a true servant king. However, the people wanted a warrior king. Many of those, perhaps the vast majority, cheering and waving and laying their cloaks in his path, would soon turn on him. Their idea of the Messiah was a king who would deliver them from Rome. Use your signs, use your gifts, use your miracles to make my life easier. Do we do that? Heal me. Comfort me. Be my genie in a bottle. They did not want an eternal savior. They wanted a temporal deliverer. Within a few days, it's really only about three days because this happened on Monday. We celebrated on Sunday. And he'd be getting arrested Thursday night. Within a few days, they would have him arrested. Their hosannas would be exchanged for crucify. From begging, save us, to screaming, kill him. Luke adds a fascinating revelation to this event. In Luke 19, 37 through 40, his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. How beautiful. Now look at what happens. Verse 39 of, of Luke 19. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. These guys knew the Bible inside and out. They knew that Old Testament. They knew it by memory. They knew exactly what him riding in on a donkey meant. They knew exactly what trap these people were falling into by laying down their cloaks. They knew who Jehu was. They knew Zechariah by memory. They knew what Solomon had done. They knew everything that, that we just pointed out and took me a week to gather. They knew it like that. Teacher, rebuke your disciples is what they said because he was threatening them and their way of life. How can I have studied all this time? How could I have done this and been good my whole life when he's going to come in and say all we need is him? That can't be the Lamb of God because they were in love with their system that they had created, with their works, with being honored, with their glory. Let me get back to my message. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, speaking of his disciples, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. That's how much he needs us. He could have a stone give you a sermon. That's how easily I could be replaced if we choose not to glorify and honor him, he will get the glory and the honor in whatever he does with me or you. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. They'll make the stones sing for him. He is Lord over even the stones. Even the stones will be a witness for him. In time, it would be obvious that Jesus chose both the place, Jerusalem, specifically the temple, 
and the timing, the Passover, to reveal that he was the lamb to be sacrificed. In John 1, 29, John the Baptist exclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So as I said, this priest was offering himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And remember, the rejection of him was no surprise to him. It should have been no surprise to anyone who had been with him, anyone who had witnessed his works, anyone who had heard him speak. But so many couldn't or wouldn't see who he was. Perhaps they refused to see it because he wasn't offering them what they wanted. He was offering them what they needed. How about you? The decision to accept or reject Jesus Christ was not limited to the first century, was not limited to that Palm Sunday or that Good Friday. That first holy week, the most important week in the history of the world. The decision is for each person. Will you accept what he is offering? Will you accept him? He is offering himself for you. He is offering to be your Lord and your Savior. Now look at the scene in heaven in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. John says, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes who've been washed of our sins with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb no longer Hosanna because they've already been saved brothers and sisters one day every day will be Palm Sunday as we honor our King eternally. The question is, will you be there? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this message. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for this moment and this weekly celebration of what you did for us. I ask you be with every person here. Draw them near to you. For those who may not be saved yet, I ask that you break through to them right now. Have them realize that this sacrifice was for them. It was done on their behalf. God, I ask that you be with Dennis as we just received word that he'll be going into surgery for an obstruction. So I ask that you be with the the surgeon, the anesthetist, the the, um, operating room, techs and nurses, just have them care for him as they would their own son or brother. Father, each person here has needs and wants that perhaps they have not even shared, but I ask for you to to guide them and love them and draw them nearer to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.